The Fetch API is a built-in JavaScript interface to handle HTTP requests. It replaces the older XML version with a more powerful and flexible feature set. The focus of this lesson is how to use the Fetch API with Vue. We don't want to worry about setting up and configuring a backend storage solution yet. So, for our API endpoint, we'll be using JSON Placeholder. JSON Placeholder is a free online REST API with fake data. Think of it as a fake backend storage solution that we can use for learning or testing. It should be noted that some endpoints like Firebase use a custom tool set to interact with their APIs. In that case, we don't use Fetch like we do in this lesson. We cover how to use Vue with Firebase later on in this series. The Fetch API uses the Fetch method to perform all of its operations. The method takes two arguments. The first argument is the path of the resource we want to fetch. The second argument allows us to specify request options in an object. For the most part, we're only interested in the method, headers, and body options. Method is a string with the type of HTTP request we want to send, like get or post. Headers is an object that allows us to specify the type of content we're working with. And body is an object with the data we want to process. When the fetch method gets data, it doesn't return it directly. It returns a promise with a response object. Because we're working with a server and a dataset that might be large, processing the fetch method may take some time. A promise is JavaScript's way of saying, we promise the fetch method will process the data at some point. The application won't stop and wait for the promise to complete. While it's running, JavaScript will continue down the document and execute the rest of its code. The then block is a way of saying, when the promise is fulfilled, then do something. And if we encounter an error at any point during the operation, we can handle it in the catch block. The then and catch blocks take an anonymous or arrow function as argument. We can also chain more than one to the statement if needed. Let's start by learning how to receive data with a GET request. To keep things simple for the moment, we'll use a button that invokes the function that will get the data. If we go to the JSON placeholder website under the Roots section, we can see the data we're able to access. To start with, we want to retrieve the content of a single post. So, our fetch resource path can be the posts slash one URL. When we're getting data, we don't have to add the second argument with the request options. The default request type for the fetch method is get, we don't have to specify it explicitly. The content also already has a type, so there's no need for that either. If we want to convert the data to another type, we do so after we retrieve it. And, because we're not adding or updating values, there's nothing to put in the body. As we mentioned earlier, the method returns a promise containing a response object. But, this is just the HTTP response, not the actual JSON content. We'll need to extract the JSON content from the response ourselves. The response object implements the body interface, which contains the JSON method. This method will parse the content and return a promise with the result as an object. As an example, let's chain a then block to the fetch method. Inside it, we'll add an arrow function with response as a parameter to store the response object in. The last step is to call the JSON method on the response object. At this point, JavaScript retrieves and extracts the data, so we can use it. To do that, we need to return the parsed results, which we're already doing, because if an arrow function only contains a single statement, we don't have to specify the return keyword. When we return a value, it's passed to the next then block. If we use another arrow function, the value will be stored in its parameter. The JSON method returns an object. So, in our example, the data parameter becomes an object, and we can access the keys of the parsed results with dot notation. For example, if we wanted to access the post title, we'd say data.title. 
For our demonstration though, we'll console log the entire object. If we switch over to the browser and click on the button, the whole object will be shown in the console. But logging the data to the console isn't very useful. So let's show the blog post content on the page. We'll start by storing the data in an object. The blog post from JSON placeholder has four keys, namely ID, user ID, title, and body. We'll display the ID and title in a heading below the button and the body in a paragraph below the title. We won't use the user ID here. If we switch over to the browser and click the button, it will show the post's content below the horizontal line. So far, we've only fetched a single object. But, in a real-world application, we'll often be working with many objects. JSON Placeholder has 100 post objects. To fetch them, we need to change the path to posts without the one. We'll also change the data property from an object to an array. When the data is assigned to it, it will become an array of objects. Finally, in the template, we'll loop through the array with the v4 directive. If we go to the browser and click the button, it will show all 100 posts. In some cases, we may want data to be available when a page loads. Like we learned in the lifecycle hooks lesson, we can tap into the phase where a component is first rendered with the mounted hook. A rendered component means we can access and manipulate the DOM, so this is the perfect place to fetch and display our data. To demonstrate, we'll invoke our get posts method in the mounted hook instead of using the button. If we take a look in the browser, we see the blog posts are rendered when the page loads. When we're sending data, we need to specify additional options as a second argument. The first is the request method. We're sending data, so the option should be set to post. Next is the request headers. The only required header is content type, which allows us to specify the type of media we're sending. And finally, the request body. This is where we specify the actual data we want to send and how it should be stored by the receiving storage layer. To demonstrate, we've set up our root app component to take input from a form for the same data that JSON placeholder expects, minus the post ID. The next step is to add fetch in a custom method that will be executed when the form is submitted. JSON placeholder allows us to use the same resource path that we used with the get request, so we can add it as the first argument. As the second argument, we'll set the method to post, the content type to JSON, and the body to the data we get from the form. But, the data in the body option is a JavaScript object. They may look the same, but JavaScript objects and JSON object literals are not the same. A JSON object literal cannot be an object because JSON is a string format. That means we need to convert our JavaScript object into a JSON object literal. Luckily, JavaScript provides us with the JSON.stringify method to do the conversion. All we have to do is specify an object we want to convert as the argument for the stringify method. In our case, that's the object in the body option. To see if our data was added, we'll log it to the console. If we submit some data in the form and click on Create Post, we'll see the console log update with ID 101. Updating data is similar to sending it. The resource path may or may not be the same, depending on the API you're working with. 
but we also need at least the method, headers, and body request options. We can update data in one of two ways. We use put as the method when we want to update an entire data set. And we use patch when we want to update only specific parts. As mentioned, we use the put request when we want to update an entire set of data. In our case, that's all the keys in the JSON object literal. To keep the example simple, we'll hard code the values we want to update. JSON placeholder also requires us to specify the post ID we want to update in the resource URL. As a side note, it's important that we specify a value for all the keys in the JSON object literal when using put as the request method. If we omit a key, that key's value will automatically be assigned the value of null. If we go to the browser and click on the update post button, we'll see an object in the console with the data we just updated. If we only want to update a single piece of data in a set, we can use patch as the request method. For example, let's say we only want to change the title of our blog post. If we go to the browser and click on the button, we'll see an object in the console with the data we just updated. But this time only the title will be updated. The other post content, like the body, will still have its original value. When updating data, when should we use put and when should we use patch? In short, when we need to replace an existing resource entirely, we can use put. When we're only doing a partial update, we can use patch. We'll leave a link to the written version of this lesson in the description if you want to know more about the technical differences between put and patch. Deleting data with the fetch method is very simple. All we have to do is specify the delete request method on the resource path we want to delete. Your API may work differently, but for JSON placeholder, we need to specify the post number we want to delete in the resource path. If we go to the browser and click on the button, we'll see an empty object in the console. This indicates that the post was successfully deleted. It should be noted that JSON placeholder only mimics the delete request. So, if we attempt to get the post, it will still exist. On a real server, the data will actually be deleted. In the next video, we'll learn how to use the popular Axios library for HTTP requests in Vue. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next one.